right, the next fly we're gonna jump into tonight is the Kamikaze Sculpin. Um, this one in the vise here is the olive version, black barred olive. Uh, this fly comes in three colors, black barred gray, black barred tan, and black barred olive, obviously. Um, it comes in two sizes. This is the four. This is the one we're gonna be tying tonight. This one comes in just under three inches-ish, just, just shy of three inches. It's tied on a number four hook um, with some quality dumbbell eyes. Very, very good sculpt and imitation. Uh, the tan, it has a lot of gold flash in it. Very, very good, um, kind of suckery, almost brown trout color. It is called the Kamikaze Sculpin, but it does come in three different colors, and you can you know, fish this in, you know, to imitate a lot of different bait fish. Uh, the gray one is a fantastic young little shad imitation, um, or anywhere there's you know, lighter colored sculpins. So in those three colors, you can really mimic most, you know, a lot, a lot of different bait fish in three kind of distinct color combos. Um, this is my favorite color, especially for streamer fishing, moving water. You know, this, this olivey black barred, you know, uh, color for, for most sculpins. Very, very good one. Uh, so we'll jump into this. Uh, we're gonna put a 5263 Tiemco in the vise. Uh, again, this is a number four. The small version comes on a number eight, so it's considerably smaller. It comes in at, you know, two inches, um, and, and the, the, the dumbbells are much smaller, so it's, it's a real small little imitation. Um, that hook, for some reason, looked like it was a little deformed. Maybe not. We'll switch to that one. Uh, for the thread, we're going to use 140 olive. Um, we are going to put a dubbing loop of rabbit fur at this at the end. I prefer to uh, put coarse materials that I need uh, super, super tight like hair and fur. If I'm gonna put those in dubbing loops, I like to use 140. Um, if it's just dubbing or smaller flies, a 60 uni is fine. But for this particular fly, I do, use, I do like to use 140. Um, we're gonna put dumbbell eyes. This hook is gonna ride just traditional hook down. It's not gonna be um, a fly that, that flips over. So we're gonna put the dumbbells on the bottom of the shank, right? And I put them fairly close to the eye, you know, two eye lengths or so back, um, but put them up there pretty tight. And then to put on the eyes, the way I like to do it is a combination of figure eights over, 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 do that about three times. And then I come under and basically parallel with the hook shank this direction like this. And then I pull those tight and I'll do those about three times. And then once I get them on there where I want them situated, I look straight down the shank and you can still move them at, at this point. They move actually very easily. Uh, they're not locked in at all. Make sure they're nice and nice and straight. I'll grab some uh, Zappa Gap in, a, in this little brush with the, or in this little bottle with the brush in the cap. Little drop on the top, little drop on the bottom is all you need. And while that Zappa Gap is nice and wet, Continue to figure eight, and then wrap your horizontal wraps, figure eight, horizontals, figure eight, just go back and forth. And that thread is gonna soak, or that glue is gonna soak into this thread. And by the time we get up to this fly to finish this head, those eyes are gonna be locked on there for good. They will never spin, uh, they'll never come loose. They're, they're on there forever. Uh, these are pseudo eyes. I don't know if I mentioned them. These are pseudo eyes. They come from hairline. Uh, they're a really, really good product as far as a dumbbell. The pupils uh, essentially never come out. Uh, you can absolutely just use standard lead dumbbells. Work absolutely fine. Um, I just like the little bit better detail in the eye, and, and they don't get banged up as much as the, as the lead dumbbells do. Um, not quite as heavy. Makes a little, the fly a little bit easier to cast, but the, the quality in those eyes and, and the fact that the pupils will stay on there essentially indefinitely uh, is the reason why I use those guys. Next material we're gonna put on here is gonna be the flash, the underbelly, kind of the support for the, for the rabbit zonker that's gonna go on. Um, uh, this, this product goes by a lot of different names. Angel hair, wing and flash, ice wing fiber. Um, it's basically just shredded up mylar. I really, really love to use this stuff on streamers because it just swims in the water so nice. Um, it's very, very unruly. Uh, so I generally never even take it out of the bag. Um, it comes hanked, so there's a little zip tie in there. Um, if that zip tie is loose enough, all you have to do is put the end out, grab however much you want, and pull it out. And I don't even ever take it out of the bag. Uh, sometimes that zip tie is so tight, you can't do that. 
but if it's loose enough, that's, that's what I do. And as you use it more, obviously, as you pull material out, that zip tie will get looser and it's easier to do. Um, a good quality hank and basically just throw it on the shank. Doesn't matter where. A couple turns, pick up the stuff that's going forward, fold it back, and then lock this down. You don't have to do, go all the way to the eye to do this, just somewhere on the shank. Um, having a comb handy to just rake this out. This stuff is usually very, very straight. You don't really get too many tangles in it, but just to keep it straight, running a comb through, it's not a bad idea. And I don't know if I mentioned, this is just straight olive. Uh, you can find this stuff, especially angel hair or ice wing fiber in every color under the sun. Uh, but this is just straight olive. Lock it down nice and tight. It's folded over, locked back onto itself. It's never gonna go anywhere. Um, I don't trim it at this point. I just leave it really, really long. We'll trim it once we get the zonker on there. Next material we're gonna use, we're gonna go to black barred olive variant uh, rabbit zonkers. This is standard width. This is not a magnum cut. And they're really, really nice olive with black bars on it. And what I like to do is make sure the end is, is clean, right? Make sure you have a nice clean straight cut. And then I'm going to cut a little bit of a triangle in this. I come from the underside, so the hide up. I'm going to come underneath so I don't cut. You can't just cut this like this. You're going to cut all the fur. So you have to get in between the hide and the fur and just cut a little bit of a triangle in there. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just tapers out the end, something that looks like that. So you get a little bit less tape, a little bit less fur on the very end of that fly. And that's all you need to do. And then we're gonna give this a little bit of a measure. Again, this fly is right about three inches-ish. I know on my vise, that's right about at the top of this uh, jaw lock right about there. So I'm just gonna give it a, a little bit of a measure. And I wanna measure the hide. I don't measure the fur. Uh, but, but another way to do this is just measure the hide one shank length long. And then that's gonna give you right at three inches. So on this fly, I measure the hide right on top of the shank, right there. I mark it with my finger. Then I come in and I part it. Give it a nice clean part right down to the, to the hide. Separate all the fur. I'm going to lay this right on the top of the shank, hold it with my left hand, come over the top, pull down one, pull down two, pull down three, pull down four, pull down five. This is 140. You can, you can really, really wrench on it. Once it's tight, underneath, I go forward a little bit, I come back and I lock that tight to that. That's going to help it lock that, uh, that zonker at that tie off point. You got something like that and it's right about to there, right about three inches. Perfect length. Um, at this point, if you can just get rid of this flash, it's a it comes a little bit annoying to leave it on there. Um, so I just come underneath, I cut the flash. Um, so on your zonker, you've got where the hide ends and where the fur ends. I cut the flash 50-50, right in between the two. So the flash is just gonna end right in the middle of the hide and the fur. And I just cut it square. Uh, on this particular fly, I don't worry about tapering it or anything. I just cut it square off. It's absolutely fine. I'm gonna fold this back. You can throw this under there, get it out of your way. Now we're gonna, next material is we're gonna use dubbing and we're gonna cover this shank. This is the uh, semi-sealed dubbing. This is straight olive. It's number 12. Like you're gonna see me several times tonight. There's a big bunch of this out of the bag. Pull it, stack it. This is gonna give us a nice kind of, not overly shiny, but shiny belly on this fly. It's, it, this, this olive color is a little bit lighter than the rabbit, so the belly's gonna be lighter. Still olive, but lighter than the top, so it's gonna give it you know, a distinct top and bottom and give it a nice shine to the underside to this fly. And once you pull it and stack it, just throw it on the table. Um, somewhere on here, we do have to do this whole uh, shank between the between the tie off of the zonker and the eye. So you want good size good size uh, loop on this one. So pull it fairly far, nine inches or so. Uh, it'll be way more than we need, but I always like to make them bigger than I need. Lock this in, and I'll go over this. I'll go over this again because we're going to do this on the head of the fly as well. But that dubbing loop pulled the thread towards me. Put my pointer finger in. So I just locked it into the edge of the vise there. 
moved the thread back forward, so now I have this big loop. All right, I locked it, so I locked it to itself. We did it on the previous fly. We'll do it on the next fly. We'll do it on the next fly after that. Nice, nice big loop. What we're going to do is take this dubbing that we prepped. I keep it in my left hand. I keep my pointer finger in the loop. I pull just the corner of the dubbing. Pull what comes out is what comes out, and I put it in the loop. Grab the corner, pull. Grab the corner, pull. It's just, you know, grab the corner, pull, stack. And then as you work down this loop, gravity, the longer this loop is, the more gravity is going to come into play. As you stack materials in here, this is almost to the vise. So that's a big dubbing loop. If I just left this like this, as A, as I go further down, there's more material above it that's going to fall, and the loop is getting, uh, the loop is held uh, more open at the bottom because my finger is in there. So what I do is I turn the dubbing loop at me. Now gravity is not pulling the material down out of the loop. And then we're just going to continue to put this in here. Very, very simple. Dubbing loops are a fantastic tool. Um, and they're, they're not as complicated and hard to do as a lot of people think. Once we get that filled, I mean, I've got I know, six inches worth in there. I put my dubbing spinner in. That's going to lock it tight. Make sure everything is, is clean. I did a good job prepping the dubbing so it's all sparse. It's not clumped up in any way, so you don't have to do anything at this point. I just basically hold my fingers right above the dubbing nice and tight, and I'm going to spin this loop. In between my finger and the loop is going to get super, super tight. Once that's super, super tight, I can feel it on my fingers. I let go, and it shoots up. It's going to lock everything, and then a couple more spins after that. Once it's spun up at the shank, you know, it spins around a dozen times. That's, that's plenty. It's super, super tight. Take a good quality dubbing brush with some brass bristles that you can really go to town on, and we're going to rake this out. You can't really, if this dubbing loop is done correctly, you cannot overdo this. This dubbing should not slide. You shouldn't all of a sudden have a big open spot where you didn't before. Your brush should not be filled with dubbing. I mean, it should just make it very, very sparse. Like it was when you put it in, the dubbing is all in place. This, this, at this stage of raking, all it does is pull any fibers out of the loop that got trapped and it stands them all up. So, if at this point, if, if dubbing is falling out, if you're getting big spaces in your loop, this is not tight enough. Spin it tighter the next time you do it. And at this point, once you have that, all we're going to do is very, very simple. Just palmer it forward. Just big, loose wraps. Come, bring that dubbing loop all the way over. And you can wrap this pretty tight. Each time I do it, I fold it back. And you can see it's, it's completely trapped. And there's we're, we're going to address that after we tie it off, but don't worry about that. As you wrap these, a lot of that du dubbing does get trapped down. Wrap all the way to the eye. You can go pretty tight to the eye with this because we're going to jump back onto the loop. So just go right to the eye. You don't have to go super, super tight. And again, one, two, almost no pressure. It's just the weight of the bobbin. Pull that down a little bit. I switch hands, pull up, pull down, and then come back where you're locking this off is folding it back, is where all the pressure is put to hold this in place. Uh, when I tie it off forward, it's just to hold this in place so I can switch hands. Now, once I've locked it back, I've jumped the thread literally up onto the tie off point. It's never going anywhere. Little triangle on your scissors, push and pull. And then at this point, again, like I said it on the previous fly, say it on the next fly, when you're raking out, dubbing it in a loop, start by going forward regardless of which direction you want the dubbing to end up, rake it forward. It's going to really, really clean it up. It's going to get all of the fibers out that are trapped. You can see within, you know, 10 seconds, we've completely cleaned all of that up. Now at this point, this is the belly. We want again, <clears throat> like the, the previous slide, the leech, we want to essentially kind of treat this like a scud. Pull them down. This side, each side, use your brush so they go straight down. There's almost nothing left on the top. Whatever fibers fall to whatever side, just leave them be. Take this, fold this over, pull it tight. I am not going to worry about parting the hide on, the, on this tie-off point. The tail was very important. This part it is not, and I actually don't part it for a reason. I just pull it tight, 
wherever it lays, I hold it nice and tight and lock it down. By not parting the fur, you get this little bump right here because you've got the long fibers and all of the short fibers as you just went straight down and it creates this nice little bump. That's gonna give you a nice little kind of sculpin head. They've got a big shovel head on the top, very flat belly. So that's gonna help us build a little bit bigger head right there by, by doing that. So at this point, we've got flash on the back, belly color, really, really nice belly color. We've got our, our back or our wing on the fly. Next material we're gonna get into is a mallard flank feather. Um, I've got a couple pre-selected ones here. Uh, when, you, when you grab a bag of mallard, it comes in a bag like this and it's not strong. Um, it's just a whole bunch of assorted sizes in one bag all mixed up and every bag is different. You can't really pre-select a good bag versus a bad bag. You just gotta buy one and you get what you get. Um, so what I do is I go through those bags, I'll dump this entire bag out on a table and I'll sort them and I'll go small through extra large. So small, medium, large, extra large, four different sizes in each bag. Now you're not guaranteed to get many of each size in each bag, but what that does is it, it makes tying flies where you're gonna palmer these feathers much easier if you have them pre-sorted. And this is what I would call a large feather. There are bigger ones than this in some bags and those, those go into the XL bag. Really, really big. They're almost too big to use on a lot of flies. But this is what I would consider like a large mallard flank feather. You can see one way to kind of measure them is just at, near the bottom at the longest pull it out from the stem and just kind of hold it behind the eye. And I'll do it on this side so you can see. That goes all the way past the, the bend of the hook. It goes you know, all the way back about halfway. And that's what we're looking for. We don't want a really short mallard feathered flank. You're, it's gonna get buried by the head and it's really not gonna do what you want it to do. There's beautiful, beautiful modeling on these flies or on these feathers. And when we palmer this, it's gonna add another dimension to this fly, kind of give it the the imitation of peck fins on a sculpin, um, just, just bait fish scales uh, on the gray one and the tan one. So we want it to be long. So all said and done in a nutshell, choose a good size one, give it a measure before you, before you go any farther. And then what we're gonna do, and as you're sorting them, you can do this too to make, so you don't have to do this each and every time you tie the fly. So just as you sort them, just basically get rid of all the fluff on the bottom. There's almost no, no fly where you're gonna need the fluff on there. So if you sort them and do that, when you wanna tie any sort of streamer when you're, and you're gonna palmer a mallard flank feather, if you have them already looking like this in different bags and different sizes, it's gonna save you a bunch of time. Um, and then at this point, once you have the feather sized, it's the right size you want, it's the right color, all we're gonna do is grab the tip and we're gonna to start to separate, go up and down. Right, we're gonna pull the fibers down, we're gonna pull these fibers up. You're gonna have something that looks like that. Uh, these are really, really short. This is gonna be buried on the inside, so you, know, you, don't have to go, you don't have to go very, very close to the tip. Come down a little bit so you have something that looks like that. Once you have something that looks like that, all you're gonna do is cut it off and give yourself a little, little triangle. Now I'm gonna take the feather on my side, the top of the feather, right, where, the, where the, I like to look at it or picture it as where the water hits on the bird, the outside or the top of the feather is towards me so when I pull this up and wrap it, the fibers are already kind of trained to go backwards. If you do it the other way, and this gets pulled up like this, they're facing forward, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. You wanna make sure you tie it in with the top of the feather towards you. And all we're gonna do is I do it on my side so I can see what I'm doing. Take that little triangle, throw it into that notch behind the eyes, and just lock this down really, really tight so it doesn't pull out when you go to wrap it. Super, super simple. Now I pull it up and they're already kind of trained to go backwards. Now at this point, you can make wrapping it a little bit easier. I wet my fingers and I pull those fibers up and back. Do that a couple times. And then once they're kind of where you want them, I come in and I pinch the stem. Pinch it really, really hard. That's gonna fold those fibers back even more. Now you have something that looks like that. All the fibers are up and back, and now they're even pulled back by me pinching it. At this point, you're good to go. Since we pulled all the fluff off the bottom, we prep the tip, you just wrap the whole feather. You don't have to count turns. However many turns you get out of the feather 
is what you're going to get. I just wrap the whole thing. And then you come up and you should have a bare stem. Grab that stem a couple times. All right, pull down, pull up. It's locked. And then just come in and just bury it. Now you can come in and you can preen these fibers out. We can get rid of our stem. You can see they all kind of give that fly a really, really nice mottled look. When this fly is wet, they, they preen back. When you stop the fly on a pause, sometimes they kind of you know, flare forward, give a really, really good imitation of just either scales and or peck fins on the baitfish imitation. And that's where we're at at this point. The last thing to do is put on the head. Um, the head, I will be honest with you, takes a little, little bit of practice. Um, let me just do a quick prep here, clean up some spots. So what we're gonna do for the head, uh, so, for, so for the body, we use black barred olive in standard with zonker. For the head, I'm gonna switch to, first switch is I'm gonna go to Magnum zonkers. I get more fur Per the, per the length of the zonker in a magnum. And these are frost tips. They come from hairline. So it's, it's black barred, and then they dye the tips in various colors, and this is the olive. So you get this olive-tipped fur with a black, it's kind of, I don't know if you can really pick that up, but the bottom is all black, and the tips are olive. So what we're gonna do to make this head, we're gonna cut this fur off of this zonker, we're gonna put it in a loop, measure it, get all the tips nice and even, put it in a loop, palmer it through this head, and what that's gonna do is, so the tips are gonna go first, they're gonna go back, and there's gonna be olive tips, and it's gonna fade to black when we get to, to behind the eye. So it's gonna go black, and then a gradual fade into this olive. Very, very cool look when you, when you palmer this uh, frost-tipped rabbit. If you, if you don't wanna try to find this or use this, you don't have to. Uh, the one thing I would not recommend is using this for the head. So this is olive with black bars on it. If you cut this off and put it in a loop, when you twist it, the black bars just mix into the olive in a not very aesthetic way, and it just doesn't look very good. So I would use this for the head, or straight olive variant, or straight black. So black, olive, or the, 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 the olive tip dyed black, if that makes sense. It'll just give you a little bit cleaner looking head. And then before I jump into this, one more thing I just want to explain is when, I, when we make this dubbing loop out of this rabbit fur, I want to explain this now before I have all of this fur in this loop. When I, when I palmer this head to get this shape, right? you can see there's, there's a nice um, you know, a bit of, of fur on the head and a little bit sparser on the belly. I need to get this wet. You can see a real, real nice curvature on the head. To achieve that, what I'm gonna do is, again, once this is all gonna go in this loop, we're gonna make this uh, a rabbit fur dubbing brush right here on the fly. But before I do that, I'm gonna explain to you how I wrap it when we have that made. So, once, so I'm just gonna pretend like it's all made. When I'm gonna wrap this head on here, I'm gonna do, looking at what I have here, it's most likely gonna be two wraps to get me tight to the eye. Now, when I get tight to that eye, I'm not going to figure eight through this like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get tight to the eye. I'm going to go over the top from the back to the front through the middle. And when I get to that far eye, I'm going to go underneath the eye. And then go under the eye with the rabbit. Then when I get to the top, I'm going to go over it towards me now from back to front over the top. When I get to the eye on my side, I'm going to go under the eye and then back over the top to the front. So you're never going underneath the dumbbells with the rabbit unless it's wrapped behind or in front, if that makes any sense. It'll make more sense when I do this. But what that's gonna do is it's going to stack more of the fur on top of the head, less on the belly. So when it's coming through the water, you're gonna have more water push or a fuller head on top, less under the belly. That was a long explanation, but I'll do it now before I get to the point where it's hard to explain when I got all this going on. So the next step to make these dubbing brushes, again, it takes a little, little bit of practice, but it's ultimately not that hard. 
just give yourself a clean workspace next to your next to your vise. And I'm going to take this zonker, get it a little bit wet. The static from your fingers gets it all crazy. My left hand, I'm going to grab as much fur as I can, and I'm going to pull it straight out from the zonker, and I'm going to hold it there. Then I'm going to come in, and I'm kind of going to pull the zonker away. Now at this point, I'm going to take my scissors. I'm going to come underneath and cut it off of the hide. One little bunch at a time. Uh, on this size four, we're gonna need three bunches of this. Now I've got this nice little bunch of rabbit. Um, this is fairly short. This zonker of the fur is fairly short, so there's really no measuring needed. Um, the, as, as much length as I can get. And then all I'm gonna do is switch hands. I'm gonna come back in and I'm just gonna square this up. Now this bunch is ready. I'm gonna carefully put it down on the table. Um, that's where you can go wrong. Um, just, just kind of put it on the table and just drop it. Don't try to place it or, or, or move it at all. Uh, it's just gonna keep those tips nice and aligned. And we're gonna do number two again. Left hand, pull it tight, pull that away, come underneath, cut as much off as you can, switch hands, get rid of any little bit of under fur that comes out. A nice little bunch of fur. That one's actually nice and square. I don't even have to square it up. Just put it on the table. One more. And you can buy, the, you know, they make pre-made dubbing brushes and even, and even, you know, rabbit fur brushes that you can buy, but they're very expensive. And, and with a little bit of practice, you can make all of these brushes essentially at home for very little cost. And you can even do it like we're doing here. This isn't a pre-made brush. I'm not making it in a dubbing loop twister with wire and all of that. I'm just doing each one to each particular fly. And you can very easily switch the rabbit color, and do whatever you want, you know, and you can just, with whatever materials you wanna do it with. So it's very customizable and, it, and it's not nearly as hard as, uh, as, it, see, as it looks. And at this point, uh, one other thing, so now we're gonna jump into, we did dubbing for the belly, uh, it was just a standard dubbing loop. We're gonna put fur in this, and I want this to be super, super, super tight. I do not want that fur to fall out of that loop. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a double dubbing loop. So there's one, I'm gonna come back again and go two. So now I've got two strands of 140 on each side. Um, it's almost unbreakable. You can twist it so, so hard, and that rabbit is not going to fall out. So again, we've got this nice big dubbing loop, two strands on each side of 140, We've moved the thread to the back behind the eye. So now at this point, we're gonna pick each one of these up and I'm just gonna put them in. That's it for now. Just put it in. Pick the next one up. Again, this is where you wanna leave your dubbing loop very horizontal to you. These will fall right down if you try to do it with the dubbing loop down. And I don't worry about measuring them. Right now, all I wanna do is get them in the loop. Put my tool in, I pinch it, Carefully pull the tool out. Now I have these guys. Now I'm gonna move the bottom two down and I'm gonna to start to loosen up the top one, loosen up the middle one. Again, I'm just kind of pushing and pulling the fur. I'm just letting it kind of carefully move in that loop. I'll carefully pull my fingers down. And again, it's just a lot of delicate pushing and pulling and pressure. Uh, make sure you don't have any dubbing wax on your fingers when you do this. Um, don't put any dubbing wax in your loop. This, that makes this step impossible. Um, I see a lot of people that struggle with dubbing loops and they always say, you know, I, I wanna put wax in it so stuff doesn't move and fall, but that's exactly what it does. It makes stuff not wanna move. Um, so yeah, you cannot do this if you, have loop, if you put dubbing wax in your loop. We have, I don't wanna move this too much because it, it, it can fall, but if you guys can see that, how I took those three clumps which are only about an inch, and I turn them into six inches, and I can even go a little bit more. And then at this point, I'm gonna take my other hand and I'm gonna just slowly push this in. Is, can you see this? Okay. I'm gonna slowly push this in, because we don't, we don't want this centered. We want it all on one side. So we're gonna push the butts to the loop. At this point, um, you need very sharp scissors to do this. Um, if you use dull scissors, it'll kind of pull this out. Um, again, finger up near the material, we're gonna spin this. And this one I do, I don't do it as fast. 
This one, I really want to take my time and let it spin slow so that stuff doesn't fly out. Once it's tight, then you can just go to town. I'm going to come in. I'm going to rake this out. And this is, this is a fly where you will really tell if you make your dubbing loops tight enough. If that, the, the butts of those rabbit, if they're not in there tight and you rake this like this, they will come right out. But you have this super, super clean loop. You can see where I didn't even do it perfect. There are these little tiny gaps. That, that was those little bit of spaces in between. But all things considered, that, that's, as, that's as good as you're looking for. That's perfect little rabbit fur dubbing loop made on the fly. Very, very simple. Now at this point, we're going to palmer again. Like I said before, we're probably going to do, there's one, right? We're going to get to the dumbbells, so two turns to get us tight to the eyes. Now, like I, like I explained before, over the top, under the far eye, pull up nice and tight, get my fingers wet. I fold all the fur on the head back, come over the top, underneath the eye on my side, back to the top, fold everything back over the top. Again, that puts three wraps right in the middle of the dumbbells on the top. We get to the front, again, fold everything back, and however many turns it takes you, it's usually two. If you, if you put the eyes correctly, uh, we can probably force one more on this one. Uh, don't go super crazy tight to the eye, but again, at the same time, make sure it's nice and tight. Now you got something like that. Thread up and kind of pull this down and kind of break that through. Try not to trap too much fur. Again, two wraps. Switch hands. Almost no pressure on this at this point until I switch hands. I'm going to pull this up. I'm going to pull this down. That's going to hold it nice and tight. I can let it go. I'm going to come back with my left hand, pull everything back, and then I'm going to clean this up. I'm going to jump up onto the very edge of where I can feel it with the thread, where I tied off that. Pull that down super, super tight before I whip finish. Come in again, little, little tiny triangle with your scissors, put it in, push and pull. Don't, you know, don't do big, you know, uh, you know, uh, try to actually cut it with the scissors. You're going to cut a bunch, a bunch of fur and it's going to be super, super noticeable. Little triangle, put it right on the base of the dubbing loop, pull it and push it and it'll cut it right off. Super, super clean. At this point, just a whip finish right up behind the eyes there. And again, just like in anything in a loop, we want to just clean it up. So we're going to come, and you can see right here, this is a good example of how little hair is on the belly, how much is on the top. That was because of that, you know, particular way we went through the dumbbells. And then once this, you rake this all out and you fold this back, you get a super, super shovel-headed sculpin style head, you know, more on the top, less on the body. Very, very flat belly, only a handful of fibers on the belly. They fold back, not getting in the way of your hook gap. You have almost 100% of your hook gap. All that material is on the top, super, super swimmy, sticks almost straight up. And when it's wet, it's just going to give you that shape and it's just going to be absolutely swimmy in the water. Um, one thing you can do at this point, uh, sometimes when you wrap it in front, some of the fur doesn't want to stay on the bottom or the top. So what I do is I get it wet and I leave and I pull them back and I make the, the uh, this one is actually very, very good. There's distinct top and a bottom. Some aren't. So I fold it back, make sure the, the fibers that want to go on the belly stay on the belly. The ones that want to stay on the top stay on the top. And while it's wet and pulled back like that, I'll just take a little bit of bone dry on a toothpick and I'll just come in be just a touch more and I'll just put it on the top and I'll push it right to the fur and just hit it with a light and now that's going to kind of permanently separate the top and the bottom but this is this is an optional step um, I like to do this so it, it keeps the eyes nice and clean sometimes the fur when you wrap the ones in the front cover the eye so if you pull it up pull it down hit it with some UV, now you've got a distinct top and bottom. Eyes are completely visible. And that's it. Not as complicated as it looks. It's pretty easy. Um, yeah, on to the next. Oh, this was the Kamikaze Sculpin. I was told to say that at the end too. 
If anybody's tuning in late, Kamikaze Sculpin. <laughs>